Hey everybody, I uh, just wanted to take a minute and uh, go through this understanding solids, liquids, and gases with you. Um, I will kind of try to walk you through some of this background information and then show you what I would come up with for um, this examples one through eight and then uh, kind of work through this bottom part here with the three examples for um, nine. Hopefully, this was a review as you read through it as some of these topics have been covered now. But uh, regardless, let's just uh, make sure we're all on the same page. So top part here goes on to tell us solids, liquids, and gases, they have set characteristics. Remember, we've been defining a solid as something with a set shape, or I think in lecture I said a fixed shape. Uh, here they said a definite shape. It's really all saying the same thing. It's just saying that if it's a solid, its shape and its volume, they're set. So solids, they're going to tend to resist being pulled apart. That's a solid. Shape, set. Volume, set. Could this be changed? Sure. But just as it's left on its own without some sort of outside force or energy being introduced, it's going to have set volume and set shape. And uh, another characteristic here is solids. Um, a lot of them have what's referred to as elasticity. Think about like an elastic waistband on uh, like sweatpants or pair of undies. Um, that would be a real example of elasticity where when you pull it and let go, it actually returns back to its original shape. So some solids are going to bend and some solids are going to twist and some solids won't necessarily display elasticity. But there's some odd examples that we'll go through in class where I make mention of things that are elastic that you probably wouldn't think of. So like a rubber band, that's a real good example of something that's very elastic. But it turns out things like steel, they're actually pretty elastic as well. If you've ever hit a piece of steel and you heard it kind of vibrate and make a sound, what that was from was the steel's elasticity. So another characteristic that uh, solids will often have, not all, but some, is uh, that they're malleable. And I'm guessing that's a term that you hadn't heard before. But uh, malleable is basically just a fancy way of saying you can hammer it into a different shape or you could draw it out into a wire shape. That's oftentimes referred to as being ductile. But uh, gold, for example, if you had a lump of gold and you hammered it out, you could get it to where it's an atom of gold thick and extremely flat. You could fold that up, you could twist that up, or you've seen all the different shapes that gold could be in. That's not to say that gold's the only solid that displays malleability. It's just an example that was given here. So moving on to liquids. Liquids, we said, have definite volume, but not definite shape. Or in lecture, I said that it has a fixed volume, but not a fixed shape. It'll just take on the shape of its container. So think about if you had like a glass of water and you poured it into a cereal bowl. And then you took that cereal bowl and you poured it into a cookie pan. And then you took that cookie pan and you poured it into a bendy straw. That liquid's just going to take on the shape of its container. But the volume, remember the one word definition we're using for volume is space. The space that that liquid takes up, it's not going to change, but the shape would. So there's some pretty neat things that can happen with liquids. And it involves the surface tension and uh, this process that's referred to as capillarity. Uh, capillarity is actually where liquids will get drawn up into something against the pull of gravity. Think about if I had a tray of water and I put in a piece of paper towel. What you'd see is that paper towel soaks or pulls up that water. So you might be thinking like, yeah, no kidding. Paper towels, they're absorbent. But that's actually going against the flow of gravity. And there's an awful lot that goes on with capillarity that I'd like to talk to you about at another time. So the third phase that we're going to discuss here, not to say that there's only three. Remember, we've got plasmas and actually some other neat ones that we'll talk about later in the class. But we're just going to go solid, liquids, gases here. Gases, no set shape, no set volume. They're just going to expand and they're kind of moving free and far apart. So when we think of solids... A lot of times kids will think that there's no motion and then some motion and then a ton of motion. Remember, even with solids, there's a little bit of vibration at the atomic level. Is it as much as if it were to turn into a liquid or a gas? Absolutely not. But I don't want you to think that there's no movement. Things are always in motion. And we'll discuss that later when we do get into the uh, atomic structure. 
So here, I'm going to read each of these. And if you want to pause and just think for a minute, what would you come up with as an answer? That would be fantastic. And then I'll explain with what I came up with. So one says, we'll expand and fill the container into which it's placed. So if it's expanding, sounds like it's volume, the space must be changing. So if that's happening and then it's just gonna fill up that container, that must mean that it's shapes changing. I'm gonna go with a gas. So of these, which one has definite shape? Remember, if we've got solids, liquids, gases, we've been saying these guys have definite volume and definite shape. Definite volume, not shape, neither are definite. So that would mean that this has to be a solid. Is malleable, which means that its shape can be changed into a new shape. That was one of those terms that uh, I had just discussed earlier. That's going to be a solid. Surface tension is evident when drops are formed. Now, I didn't discuss this a whole lot with you yet, but when we do talk about capillarity and surface tension, those are telltale signs that we're describing liquids. Has neither a definite shape nor definite volume. So in other words, shapes off and volumes off. That's like the extreme of a gas. The shape changes when placed in a new container, but the surface remains horizontal. That sounds to me like it must be a liquid. A small straw can be used to demonstrate capillarity. Now the example I gave you was with paper towel. Trees also go through capillarity, but nonetheless, when I hear that, I know we're talking about liquids. And here we've got when slightly bent or twisted, it will return to the original shape. That to me sounds like elasticity, and I know that that's a descriptor of solids. So this is what I came up with. How did you do? Does that seem to make sense? If not, please feel free to ask and I can go into uh, more detail. But if not, we're just going to kind of move into uh, number nine. So number nine, sometimes this A, B, and C. Uh, kids will think a nail like a fingernail. Um, actually, what I thought this was referencing, I mean, if you went on to describe a fingernail, that's fine. But if I were to uh, look at the following, that's a solid, a liquid, and a gas, and list some of these characteristics, this nail is actually like a carpenter nail, which is a metal. So if this is a nail here, I would probably say, well, it's solid. Nails tend to be made of metal. I guess they don't have to be, though. Um, we could say that, you know, since it's a metal, it's got kind of a silverish or a grayish color to it, which a lot of metals do. Uh, it's gonna have a little bit of luster. That's a fancy word for um, shiny. Now you could have some dull nails or perhaps nails with oxidation on their surface and that might change this luster here. But here's onesie, twosie, threesie, four examples. What else do you think would uh, help describe a nail as in like a carpenter's nail? So here we've got a water and water is of course a liquid. Now, could you have a solid or a gaseous form of water? Absolutely. But water is a liquid. So that means that it's going to be, sometimes people will say wet, but I've had some kids ask the question, okay, well, does water make things wet or is water itself wet? Yeah, puzzler, right? I'll talk to you about that later as well. But nonetheless here, we've got water. It's a liquid. Um, I always kind of have to plug in here H2O. If you wanted to make mention that there was a surface tension or that it could display capillarity, or if you want to talk here about how we could say volume, set, shape, not, that's, you know, obviously indicative of liquids, but uh, what else? What else do you think that you could come up with for water? And then oxygen which is uh, the part that we really appreciate from a cellular respiration standpoint out of the air, the O2, the breathable form of oxygen. Uh, common misconception, kids will say oxygen. Yeah, it's a gas. It's the most abundant gas in the air. 
Not necessarily true. Actually, not true at all. Turns out nitrogen is. And it's a good thing that oxygen isn't the most abundant gas in our atmosphere, or else we'd probably be engulfed in flames. So is it important? Heck yeah. But if it wasn't diluted down with that nitrogen, we'd have some real problems. So I'm just going to give you again the basic definition of, well, since it's a gas, that means that it has no set volume, which means that the space that it occupies isn't set, and no set shape. So I just put solid up here. I should probably jump back up to this and say set volume. Again, volume being the space that it occupies and its shape is set. So here's a few to get you started, at least to think about. How would you describe a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Or these particular solids, liquids, or gases? Hopefully this is starting to click. If not, please feel free to reach out, ask specific questions, or just for some clarification. Uh, until we meet again, see you later.